Hello, friends. Um, thanks for, for joining me this morning. Um, so the last couple of weeks we've been going through Philippians and, and I'm hoping we can just dig right in today um, to finish off kind of the conversation we were having last week in Philippians 2. Uh, for those of you that have been tracking along, you'll kind of know the context we've been discussing. And, and uh, if, if you're just tuning in to, to today, um, I would encourage you to go back and, and watch the last couple because there's some really good conversation that we've been having uh, regarding uh, the example of Jesus and, and Paul's letter to his friends. And, and we've said it before, and I'll just really briefly remind us, like, you know, this is a letter that Paul wrote to his friends in prison, in a state of, of uh, a certain amount of loneliness and suffering, um, but also just really conveying that all is well in his heart because he is a surrendered soul. He has said to, to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And, and he's writing to his friends and saying, you know, we're partakers in grace together. Uh, we're not just spectators. We're engaging in the good news and, and it's shaping us. And last week we talked uh, quite a bit about this, this passage um, finishing off Philippians 1 where, where Paul is saying, you know, that what our conduct should be like. What, is, what does it mean to, what is our citizen conduct in community? How are we acting? And, and, he, and he talked about striving together for that, wrestling together jointly. And, and the battle is that we need to look like Jesus and sometimes we don't. We don't want to be tempted by the dominating power structures of, of the day. And Paul certainly experienced that. And he had to lay that down. He had to lay down the pious, strong religious structure that would have given him so much uh, clout and, and power. And, and also laying down his Roman connection as a citizen too, with the power structures that were there and, and sort of the pagan idolatry of the day where elevating oneself is the supreme goal, where success is what matters, lording it over the other elevating your status. And Paul is saying in this middle path of following Christ, we reject those things. We follow him. We say to live as Christ and to die as gain. We strive together for this. So that what we say about Jesus lines up with how we live. And, and Paul, um, those powerful words last week where he said, you know, it, it has been granted to you not just to believe in him, but to suffer with him. And we don't like this word, um, and we have to ask ourselves sometimes, like, do we really suffer with the other in our lives that's going through pain and, and challenges? And, and last week, the challenge was to really uh, actively pursue uh, an opportunity to enter into someone else's suffering, to, to the story that they're in. You know, whether that's a, a note, a kind word, um, a walk in the woods, you know, um, maybe for your moment, that is what we have. For some of us, it might even be more tangible. We talked about frontline workers and people that are really connected right now to other people's suffering and, and, and how they probably understand and can teach us something about how to live as Christ. And so today, I just want to move on and, and continue with that conversation. We, we talked about how this week we will go into more of this example of Jesus because Paul, in that whole context, Paul is saying, you know, this is what we strive for in the faith of the gospel. To look like Jesus. All these virtues, all these things, the, the conduct that we talk about that we need to have, our attitude should be the same as that of Christ. He comes back to the example of Jesus. And Jesus shows us what God is like in his true heart. So we're going to read Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Um, it's a powerful passage. I love I love this section of scripture. I, I really do. Um, and I feel like um, uh, somewhat humbled by being able to even talk about these scriptures. This is one of those beautiful passages that really uh, brings a real foundational understanding to Trinitarian theology and, and just um, what Jesus came to do, how he came to respond in grace to this world. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to, to study even further than where we can go today because as we know, these this book is so deep and so powerful and and um, and beautiful, uh, and just the depth and the narratives over the thousands of years that these stories have come together. But Philippians two one to eleven, I'm going to read it and we'll we'll join together and we'll pull some thoughts out for ourselves um, and how we can do like Paul said, have this attitude in yourselves that was in Christ Jesus. So Philippians two verse one, it says, therefore if there is any encouragement in Christ, 
if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete, he says, by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. That's tough. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, which, which is also translated the nature or the fullness of God, who, who, though he existed in the nature of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now this is such a powerful section of scripture. This is the part of Philippians where Paul really, really starts to point at some of the foundational theology. You know, we, we've talked about this before, how <laughs> good theology will lead to good transformational action in the church. And, and the opposite is also true. And this is one of those foundational passages where we really come back to, to this understanding of who God is. Um, you know, when we think of the Trinity, when we try to describe that and talk about the mystery of God being three in one, I mean, these are really deep. Um, we could preach a year of sermons on, on how that works and what that means. But I think the thing we want to, for, for today, the thing I want us to really understand is that in Christ the nature and fullness of God, the very embodiment of love, was right there and fully present with man. That's what we need to really capture in this moment, is that God became fully present with us through his Son, through Christ laying down his, his divinity for that moment, taking on flesh, becoming like us so that we could understand each other so that we could know God hasn't forgotten or abandoned us. This is so important. And so we remember that as we, as we think about all this, this part of it, that in Christ, the nature and fullness of God, the very embodiment of love was right there and present with man, with us, with, with the people that he was calling out and trying to remind and speak to and call forth over these thousands of years of his presence and his prophecy and his wisdom and and all these things it's it's this drawing toward the heart of god he made us for relationship it's deep stuff and it's a mystery that is so sometimes challenging to convey and i think of it you know as a father i think of it sometimes a little bit like like this being being present with my kids, you know, there's a difference in my kids knowing that maybe I'm off working somewhere, which I do right now, travel and work. Um, you know, they may know and they may have a letter from me from time to time. Imagine if I had to live, you know, a long way off and they might know that there's a, a dad that they have who um, who's doing his best and he has, he has written letters, you know, um, he might be saving for their, <laughs> for their education. He, he has a, a desire and a will and he conveys that to his kids and then there's an, an, another thing that's even more beautiful is that when that father who has to be away and, and 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 they know that he loves them and that he cares for them and has a will and a plan to, to for their well-being but when he talks to them on the phone or, or FaceTimes them there's something beautiful about that connection hearing those words feeling that he is is more present and so I'm saying this as a father about what that feels like, you know, to be with my kids. But there's something even 
more amazing where my kids don't just know that I love them and don't just maybe hear it on the phone, but there is this moment when it all comes together when I'm present with them, when I am with them. And the words and, and, and my heart for them now comes together with a very physical presence where I'm with them. And I, I like to think sometimes of, of the Trinity a, a little bit that way. And sometimes as you, as, as we ponder this heart of God being present with us, we are amazed at what this actually means, how radical it actually is. And we'll get into that in a little moment. So Paul in the first part is talking about all these virtues that he wants us to have, right? That, that he's saying like your conduct, your citizen conduct, your, your, you should be striving to look like Jesus to, and he's saying, you know, make my joy complete by having the same mind, maintaining the same love, being united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Um, do nothing out of selfishness or vain conceit, but regard the other more than yourself. And, and it's because these virtues, these things that Paul is saying are transformational. They're countercultural in that day. He's saying it comes because we are being shaped by Jesus. It comes from him. Your attitude should be that which was in Christ. And, you know, there's tragic results when we try to live our Christian faith and it doesn't look like Jesus. I think this is something we really, really need to ask ourselves um, in our comfort, in our subculture of Christianity sometimes and in our, in our communities um, to really remind ourselves whether we are embodying that love of God who has become present with us and are we entering in and being present with others. Are we modeling that? And and I think it's so critical. Um, I love Henry Nouwen. The Wounded Healer is such a beautiful, there's so many beautiful writings. Um, I think he is a, a really beautiful, was a really beautiful thinker and writer. Um, uh, and um, I love some of the ways that Henry Nouwen um, ponders this. And, and if you know anything about Henry Nouwen's story, I mean, he, he, he left a career at Harvard to go and, and, and work um, with, with um, those with disabilities and, and those um, that have been ostracized in many ways by society living in community um, and spent time um, in places of compassion and places where, um, where he had to be humbled to go from Harvard to that. And, and to experience the gospel in such a powerful way. So Henry Nouwen, um, I think, is speaking from a very real place when he says the, the things that he talks about that I'm going to read to us. And think about this in that question, like I said, how tragic is it is if, if we do not look like Jesus? And, and this is what, what Henry Nouwen is saying in this book, The Wounded Healer. He says, if there is any posture that disturbs a suffering man or woman, it is aloofness. The tragedy of Christian ministry is that many who are in great need, many who seek an attentive ear, a word of support, a forgiving embrace, a firm hand, a tender smile, or even a stuttering confession of inability to do more, often find their ministers, distant men or women who do not want to burn their fingers. They're unable or unwilling to express their feelings of affection, anger, hostility, or sympathy. The paradox indeed is that those who want to be for everyone, as all of us as Christians should feel, find themselves often unable to be close to anyone. And then he goes on, it seems necessary to reestablish the basic principle that no one can help anyone without becoming involved, without entering with his whole person into the painful situation without taking the risk of becoming hurt, wounded, or even destroyed in the process. The beginning and the end of all Christian leadership is to give your life for others. Thinking about martyrdom can be an escape, unless we realize that real martyrdom means a witness that starts with the willingness to cry with those who cry, laugh with those who laugh, and to make one's own painful and joyful experiences available as sources of clarification 
and understanding. He says, in short, who can take away suffering without entering it? And this is exactly echoing what Paul is saying. Who can take away suffering without entering it? Christ entered it. You know, I think about the question that people have when they're saying, you know, I, 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 I could never believe in a God who, who doesn't seem to care about the earth, doesn't seem to care about this place we live in. He's so up in heaven and he's distant from us. I could never believe in a God like that. You talk about this God in heaven. I could never believe in a God like that. And I say, yes, agreed. You say, no, no, no. I, I could never believe in a God who is so far removed from, from pain and rejection and, and my suffering. Like, I, I could never, you know, he's, he's so far distant. I could never believe in a God who doesn't understand what I'm going through. And I would say, yes, agreed. You know, so many people reject God because there's this misunderstanding that he is so far removed from who they are and what their pain is, what their joy is, just their identity as being human. I could never believe in a God who doesn't understand what it's like to be human, like to be me. And I say, yes, agreed. Because we don't believe in that God either. We believe in a God who emptied himself taking the very nature of a servant and humbled himself to become like us, to show us the way to God, to show that he is not a God far off, that he is not a God far removed, but he is a God who is ever present. You know, in camp ministry, um, a lot of times you have to do jobs that are random, you know, especially in a small camp like Lynn and I spent uh, with four summers at Hopi Bible Camp. There are times when you have to wear multiple hats. And one of the things that I had to do was first aid. Sometimes that means you're up in the middle of the night, um, uh, you know, with a, with a counselor bringing a, a, a camper, you know, with a tummy ache or, or maybe homesick. <laughs> Sometimes it means you, you, uh, you have you know, a sport and a, a broken arm or, uh, or a twisted ankle or whatever. And, and so you never know sometimes what's going to happen as a first dater. And Lynn and I both had to do that role. Um, but one of the things that we talk about when working with kids and with children, particularly in any of you that are nurses, um, that working with kids or that are teachers um, or, or youth ministers will understand that in order to convey value, Lynn often says, you know, we have to live our lives as, in ministry saying to the other person, you have value. And she, that's her mantra, and I agree. And it comes out in these moments of camp ministry where you cannot just stand as a big, tall leader and sort of point down at a child and be like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, go play that game now. Or, yeah, okay, go to the nurse's station. The real way to convey value um, as Derek and, and many of the staff would call that intentional relational care, is that when a kid is a scraped knee or needs a Band-Aid or is homesick, you bend down on your knees and you maybe put a hand on a shoulder and you lock eyes and you offer words of compassion. But that posture of kneeling down the gentleness of a, of a hand on a shoulder and the eye contact that says and conveys you have value speaks volumes to, to a child. And you know, when I think about this passage, I think about how critical it is that we have a proper understanding of God. Because God doesn't look down on you. God doesn't talk down to you. God gets down with you. He gets down in the grit and the, the trage tragedies and even the, just the very human joys and celebrations of life and death. He is present. You know, we see this in the modeling of the life of Christ when he 
touched the lepers who were so cut off from community when he was was willing to be with the people that were sinners and misunderstood and and people that no one else would touch and Jesus was there he was tangibly there he was the nature and fullness of God the very embodiment of love present with man this is such a foundational it is the most important piece of our Christian faith if we do not understand how Christ has become incarnate with us we will misunderstand everything else he says from that point on God doesn't look down to us he doesn't talk down to us he gets down with us he kneels beside us it says he took the very form of a servant you imagine Jesus kneeling washing his disciples feet so the question is who kneels first in this passage it's God himself and this is absolutely the most amazing thing and probably one of the biggest reasons why my faith is so captivated in Christ Jesus kneels he puts a hand on our shoulder, he locks eyes with us, and he speaks the words of compassion and grace and truth. He speaks the words of love. Sometimes they're painful to hear. Often they're confusing to hear. But they're and sometimes they're just so beautiful and they're and but they are always the words we need. They are always the truth, balanced with the grace that bring transformation in our hearts. This was how Jesus called us to be. And who kneels first? Jesus does. But what's amazing is that in this passage, we realize that God's glory is not diminished by this act of humility. And his humility doesn't threaten his divinity. You know, his meekness in this moment overrides any sort of dominating presence. Because he is fully loved, there is no force that there's no force that can stand against it, even death that could disrupt or deter him from this. And this is radical, guys. This is counterculture, like we just said. And it's precisely why, in the presence of this kind of love, we can let go. We can kneel. We call him Lord. And we feel the privilege in that presence of his love. And we become what we behold. I love how um, Joy Keller spoke on that one time. We become what we behold. I've thought of it many times. As Jesus kneels and models to us, we cannot help but fall down on our knees and call him Lord. And we are changed in this process. And then as we fall on our knees and call Jesus Lord. We realize we are surrendered. We are not threatened. Our identity isn't diminished by this act of humility and serving the other. And we turn to the other in our lives with the same attitude of Christ, and we kneel first. And in that moment, we give them value. And so there's this beautiful thing that takes place where we kneel. We put a hand on a shoulder. We lock eyes with the other and say, I love you. And this is absolutely transformational. It's maybe not natural for us, but it is absolutely transformational. One of the things that I love about, um, <laughs> one thing Randy Hine, uh, I've talked about him before and we had him on uh, a few weeks back, but the first time I ever heard Randy Hine speak, he, 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 he said something that, that struck me and he said, you know, we, we talk about God and Jesus and, and, and all these things when we're talking about the Bible and, and, and the story of, of grace. But we forget to remind ourselves that Jesus shows us what God is like. And we're no longer locked in this trap of like, I could never believe in a God who doesn't know me, who doesn't understand me, who doesn't understand what I'm going through. This scripture reminds us that yes, this, in fact, is what God is like. Jesus modeling the love of the Father 
Jesus kneeling down, locking eyes with us. Jesus humbling himself. And in that moment, becoming the lowest, becoming the servant. He carries all things. He holds all things. And he begins to transform all things with this kind of love. Now, I don't know if that resonates with, with anyone else, but for me, it has been an absolute um, foundational piece in my faith. I want to embody the kind of posture in my life that looks like Jesus. And it is true that when anyone comes in contact with that kind of love, the kind of love of a God who doesn't leave us abandoned on this earth in all of our pain and rejection and loneliness, but comes to be like us, to, to speak with us, to lock eyes with us and walk with us, and in the same moment not being even remotely diminished in his divine beauty, and his glory, where God himself, the God of the universe, creates this open dialogue with us through Christ. I think that very few people could be confronted with that kind of love and not say, yes, I will call you Lord. And in fact, Paul says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, because everyone will one day understand the magnitude of that display and demonstration of love. And Paul is saying this, this is what should transform us. This is what will shape our community. This is why Paul is saying, make my joy complete. Get back to being like Jesus with one another. The unity the oneness of spirit and purpose, the goal to display to the world the kind of love that Jesus had. The kind of love that Jesus had that served, that spoke grace and truth, that spoke healing, that often spoke words of justice, because we need that too in this world. There are so many ways that we miss the mark of what God intended for all of us in this human story. But we see God making the first move. And may it humble us. May it diminish the pride and the arrogance in our lives. And sometimes how we bring that even into our own faith. Let's pray. Father, um, we're astounded. Lord, that you were not a God who stays far off and removed from what we go through, but you're very present with us, modeled in these words of Christ. But Lord, you're present with us by your Holy Spirit. As we turn to you, you fill us, you walk with us, and you help us to be able to be like Christ, to kneel first put a hand on a shoulder, to lock eyes, to speak words of compassion and grace. Lord, may we be able to do that somehow. We love you. We need you. Bless all my friends um, who are with us in this journey as we grow together in community. Bless their weeks. Walk with them by the fullness of your spirit. In Jesus' name blessings on your week. Love you all.